sound was as hopefully it will be today. Okay? Everybody here? Just a little housekeeping. Uh, we're going to get a smaller card made, but I've got some promotion on the next class that we're going to be teaching starting on March the 17th. We'll be finishing this series up in two more weeks. And so we're going to go into something different, which will lead us up to Easter time. And I'm going to entitle the series, Understanding the Times, based upon the tribe of Ishakar, because the tribe of Ishakar understood the times, the Bible says, and that's why they knew what to do in the nation of Israel. So, I'm looking at 11 events that have taken place in the last year. And I'm going to show you these 11 events fit into Bible prophecy and end time events. So it's going to be a biblical update on what's going on in the world today, showing you how relevant the Bible is. So you might want to pick up one of these on the way out. We will have smaller ones that you can stick in your Bible, but they made a mistake and sent the wrong ones to me. But hey, I don't want to waste them, so they're back on the table, and you can see where we're going all the way up to Palm Sunday. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you out a piece of paper uh, in a week or two, whenever, and I'm going to have a list of topics on this paper. And I'm going to ask you to choose what you would want me to teach. So you are going to be the ones that will determine. I'll, I'll give you some ideas, and if you don't like those ideas, write in what you want to have me teach. So you can do that. What book of the Bible or what particular topic may be of interest to you. So be thinking about that, will you? And we'll uh, have a good time working on it. I want to ask God to bless our time. We're in our study on apologetics. Why does God create people he knows are going to hell? Father, I ask your blessing upon this uh, study today. Father, I pray that you would be with my mind, my tongue, that I communicate what you would have me say to our class today. And so, Lord, we're thankful for your love, for your mercy, for who you are as a person, and we pray, God, that we can make sense out of a very difficult question. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We've been talking about Vincent Blagosi, and we've talked about his book, Divinity of Doubt. He was a former prosecuting attorney, and in his book, he talks about many questions that he says Christians simply cannot answer. Well, I'm going to take up the challenge. If he says a Christian can't answer these questions, I'm going to take his questions and answer them. So here's his question. Why does God create people he knows ahead of time are going to hell? Now, to Blagosi, such a God, he says, is neither good nor fair nor just. He is plain evil. Atheist David Mills wrote this. If we conclude, then, that God would create hell to detour human behavior, which he did not like, knowing beforehand the majority would, as a result, suffer eternal torture, then we would be forced to label this God as evil and sadistic also, because he likewise would have inhumanly tortured individuals in order to accomplish his goals. Skeptic Pistorius Wu, in his book, Debunking the arguments of Christian fundamentalists and evangelists writes this. If you were God and you were omnipotent and could see throughout all time, would you create a world where you knew beforehand that the majority of people would end up in hell? The implied answer is no. Now here's a problem with Wu's question. Notice he begins with the phrase, if you were God. There isn't any of us who are God. In fact, the Bible says his thoughts are above our thoughts and his ways are above our ways. Our God is a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, and there isn't a single person in this room that is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present. So it is a very stupid thing to say, if you were God. We are not God. Let's look at it like this. Let's suppose there's this five-year-old child who comes up to her mother, and she says to her mother, uh, what are you doing, Mom? See, what Mom is doing is she has a check, and she's writing out the check, 
and she's putting the check in the envelope, she's addressing the envelope, she's stamping the envelope, and she drops the envelope in the post office. What are you doing, Mommy? Well, Mother says, what I'm doing is I'm writing out a check so we can keep driving our car without the bank taking it from us. Now, this five-year-old has no idea that this piece of paper represents money. This child has no idea that the mother has to borrow the money from the bank in order to pay for the car. And if she doesn't make the payments, the car is going to be repossessed. That is above the pay grade of the five-year-old. Well, in a similar way, there are things that God has done that we humans can never fully understand for the simple reason that God has never told us why He did them or will do them. Now, perhaps He has told us, but we just haven't figured out what He said yet. Maybe God has not given enough detail in regards to the situation. But here is the text I'm focusing on today. It's found in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4. The Lord has made all for Himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. Wow. God is acknowledging through Solomon, I have created people that I know beforehand are going to end up in hell. Now the atheist says, well, that's a very sadistic, evil God who would do something like that. So how do we explain all of this? Well, huh, that's my assignment today. That's what I'm going to try to do. Maybe we have to go to the secret things of which Moses talked about when he says there are secret things that God knows all about but we know nothing about. Maybe that's the only way we can answer this question. Remember, Moses said this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which have been revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the works of this law. Okay, I'm going to take a shot at answering this question. Why would God create people that He knows ahead of time are going to end up in hell? Does that sound like a very loving God? Does that sound like a very merciful God? Why would God do something like that? Well, let's talk first of all about the fairness of God. First of all, the Bible says God demonstrates no partiality. Numerous are the scriptures that speak of the fairness and justice of God. Peter says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Paul wrote to the Colossians, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. So the first thing I want you to see, God is not a partial God. Secondly, God displays justice and mercy. He not only shows partiality, no partiality, his judgments are true and righteous. In Deuteronomy, Moses wrote this, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteousness and upright is He. Job raised a rhetorical question. Does God subvert justice, or judgment rather? Or does the Almighty pervert justice? No. And I love those words of the psalmist who said this, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Hallelujah, right? God does not keep angry as, as a part of His problem. God is just. God has not dealt with us according to our sins and according to our iniquities. So for that we can be grateful. Next, God designed man with free will. God has created us in His image and likeness. God has free will. The Bible says God does whatever He pleases. Since we are created in His image and likeness, we too have free will. We too can do whatever we please. And if God does not like it, we will pay the consequences. God is just in His judgments. 
His pleasure is to rule in truth and in righteousness. In His will, He has deemed hell as the appropriate punishment for the unrepentant sinner. Everyone has the opportunity to escape hell, but some choose hell. Why? They do not want to put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They do not want to live for Him. And so by rejecting Christ, they have chosen hell. Tim Keller, who by the way is no relation to me, writes this in one of his books. All God does in the end with people is give them what they want, including freedom from Himself. Woo. What could be more fair than that? C.S. Lewis wrote, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. Now what both Keller and Lewis are saying is this. God gives people what they want. Some people actually choose hell over heaven. Now, that may seem strange, but there's a book written by an atheist named Dan Barker. The book is called Godless. Here's what he says in the book. Speaking for myself, if the biblical heaven and hell exist, I would choose hell. Several years ago, Madonna had a popular song with a line she repeated over and over again. I don't give a damn if I go to hell. I don't give a damn if I go to hell. I was talking with a man some time ago who told me he'd rather go to hell than heaven. And I said, what is your concept of heaven? Well, he says, my idea of heaven is just floating on a cloud, strumming on a harp, and singing boring songs to God. That's my concept of heaven. I said, what is your concept of hell? He says, oh, it's an eternal party. It's I can do anything I want to do and I'm not going to feel guilty. I can drink, I can have all the women I want. That's my concept of hell. It is a place of eternal pleasure to be able to do whatever I want to do without suffering any consequences. I, of course, had to straighten him out on this issue. <laughs> God did not create people to go to hell. God has given them a choice. Jesus said of Himself, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Joshua told the children of Israel, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Moses told the children of Israel, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. And then in Matthew's gospel, Jesus spoke these words concerning one's eternal state. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and few there be that find it. So every person on earth comes to a point where there's a fork in the road. And if you go to the left, it is a wide road. And many people are traveling on that wide road, and there's the attempt to, hey, go with the crowd. And to the right, there's this narrow path. And it's a difficult path. And few people are traveling on it. And so what Jesus is saying is, when you come to that fork in the road, you better turn right and not left. Because the way to the left, the broad way, leads to destruction. Now some would argue like Pastor John Piper, who one of his blogs, uh, I got one of his blogs here, said that no one would choose hell. So I'm going to read his blog to you here. He says, the misery of hell will be so great that no one would want to go there. They will be weeping and gnashing their teeth. Between their sobs, they will not speak the words, I want this. They will not be able to say amid the flames of the lake of fire, I want this. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. 
and they have no rest day and night. No one wants this. Piper continued. When there are only two choices, you choose against one. It does not mean you want the other. If you are ignorant of the outcome of both, unbelieving people know neither God nor hell. This ignorance is not innocent. Apart from regenerating grace, all people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The person who rejects God does not know the real horrors of hell. This may be because he does not believe hell exists, or it may be that he convinces himself that it would be tolerably preferable to heaven. He goes on to say, now, what he's saying now, I never, never thought of, I mean, I just got finished, what, last year, teaching the whole book of Revelation. And he's giving a verse out of the book of Revelation that, man, it never hit me until I read this blog. Notice what he says. Piper argues that God not only sends people to hell, get this, he throws them. Did you get that? He throws them into hell. For one would not choose to go there. God certainly does not send people to hell, quotes uh, Piper. He does pass sentence. He executes it. Indeed, worse than that, God does not send. He throws. Now, here's his verse. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 15. So you can see a person coming up to the prophecies of hell. Whoa. He looks down. What he sees is not very pleasant. But that's where he's headed. He's not going to fall off the precipice on his own. He has to be thrown off that precipice. Hmm. He goes on to say, the reason the Bible speaks of people being thrown into hell is that no one would willingly go there once they see what it is. No one standing on the shore of the lake of the fire jumps in. They do not choose it, and they will not want it. They have chosen sin. They have wanted sin. They do not want the punishment. When they come to the shore of this fiery lake, they must be thrown in. Wow. Yes, every person has a choice before them. You can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or cursing. You can choose Jesus or you can choose Satan. You can choose the wide road or you can choose the narrow road. You can choose to open the door or you can choose to leave the door closed. We have a choice. Choose between heaven or hell. Now, how do we reconcile these two arguments? See, on the one hand, there are people who are saying, I choose hell. I think that would be better than heaven. And then you have Piper saying on the other end, no one would choose hell if they really understood what hell is. In fact, they'd have to be thrown in. So how do we reconcile these two sets of ideas? I think very simple. They both have some truth to it. First of all, Piper is absolutely right. No one would choose hell if they understood the biblical definition of hell. On the other hand, there are those people who say, well, the whole concept of hell is simply something out of old mythology, ancient mythology. It's not real. What the Bible says about hell is not real. Now, if hell exists at all, just like this man I was talking about, the concept that they get is this. Hell is a fast party, an eternal party, all the drinking, all the women, all the drugs, everything I want to do, and I don't feel guilty by doing it. So you see, there are those who have a misconception of hell, and because they have a misconception of hell, they think it's better than heaven. But if they really understood the biblical definition of hell, they would have to be thrown into hell because they wouldn't go there voluntarily. So we've talked about the fairness of God. And what we've said is this. There's no partiality with God. He doesn't play favorites. God is just and God is merciful. God has given man free will. Man can make choices. Sometimes he makes wrong choices. And when he does, he's going to pay the consequence. 
Now let's talk next about the forming of mankind. We've talked the fairness of God, now the forming of mankind. So we're right back to our question. Why does God create people he knows are going to hell? Well, the first thing I want you to see is it's God's decision to create mankind in the first place. Revelation 4.11 says this, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Notice, everything that exists in the universe is here because of the will of God. You are here. I am here because of the will of God. It was His will to create us. Notice the psalmist reminds us, but our God is in heaven and He does whatever He pleases. So God has free will and God's will is, hey, I want to create mankind. Now there are those who have suggested that God created human life because He was lonely and in some way deficient and needed humans as companions. Now the Apostle Paul seems to put an end to this argument when he's writing to or speaking to the philosophers in Athens. He says this in Acts 17, God who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with man's hands as though, notice, as though He needed anything since He gives life to all breath and all things. So God doesn't need anything. In fact, God doesn't even need us. So the suggestion then that God is lonely up there, and that's the very reason why He created it, that's a ludicrous argument, and for a couple of reasons. Number one, who is God? God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. God is three separate persons that comprise the one God. They have always existed from all eternity past. So if there was nothing else, the Father has the Son, the Son has the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has the Father, and so forth. So it is impossible for God to be lonely. Because God can have a relationship with Himself. But remember too, God created angels. Millions and millions and millions, tens of thousands times, tens of thousands, the Bible says, of angels. And they're up there around the throne. So, God not only has Himself to have relationships with, God has created the angels even before He created us. God does not need us. But because God does not need us does not mean that we are unimportant to God. He created us in His image and determined by His will that we would be meaningful to Him. Therefore, we as humans exist solely by the desire and will of God. So, why did God form us? Why are we here? It's for God's display that we exist. Notice what uh, the prophet Isaiah says. He says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Why are we here? We are created for His glory. That's the only reason why we exist. Now it has been suggested that if God simply created us for His glory, that this would imply that He is some kind of evil dictator who simply wants His subjects to grovel at His feet and tell Him how great He is. Now this argument falls short when we look at three things here. First of all, what does it mean to give God glory? Number one, to give God glory is a way of expressing thanksgiving for the life and blessings that we have received from Him. I think everybody, everybody in this room ought to be grateful that you're alive, right? I mean, when you got up this morning and took a breath and your feet landed on the ground, woohoo, man, I am alive. And you're glad you are. And God created you. And look at it, God has given you all kinds of blessings. He's given you talents that you can use. He's given you the ability to reason. He's given you a beautiful creation to enjoy. 
Yesterday, uh, it was Kathy's birthday, so happy birthday, hon. Anyway, it was her birthday. I won't tell you how old she is, but anyway. <laughs> you probably know anyway. Anyway, so she wanted to go to the Simon Morton Mu uh, Museum in, in uh, Pasadena. So that's, that's where we go. And on the way, we could see Mount Baldy. We could see the San Gabriel Mountains covered with snow. And it was, whoa, man, this is beautiful. I can go down to the beach, and I can watch the waves roar along the shore. God has given us a marvelous creation to enjoy. That's why we give Him glory, because of the blessings that He's given to us. I, uh, I watch Robbie Zachariah every time I get a chance. He's on YouTube, and he's a great apologist, and he speaks at universities all over the world, and so uh, he's... Uh, giving his lecture, and then he always has a Q&A session afterwards. And so here's a student that comes up and says, I did not ask to be born. So why do I have to accept Christ to be saved? It's not my fault that I'm here. Well, how do you respond to something like that? Well, you're here. You're here. There's nothing you can do about it. So while you're here, you might as well enjoy the creation that God has given you. And by the way, because you sin, you better get your life right with Christ because there's life beyond this life. You see, we can be thankful that even though we've committed sin and separated ourselves from God, this God who created us to give Him glory, God did something about this. That's why he sent Jesus into the world, in order that man and God might be one again. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, one of the great chapters of the Bible, perhaps the second greatest chapter in the Bible. Romans, you know, you know Romans 8 now is the best chapter in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 has to be second. Because there, Paul says, we are chosen of God. We are holy. We are blameless. We are inheritors of the blessings of God. We have received the Holy Spirit in our life as a guarantee that there's far more to this life than what we're living now. That's what God thinks of us when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we give Him glory. We're thanking Him for his gifts. Secondly, to give God glory is to fulfill the very purpose for our being. Now, what is our purpose? It's to give him glory. But understand something now. God created us in his image and in his likeness. And God knows what it takes to make us happy, to make us prosperous, to make us fulfilled with life. God knows. We come with an instruction manual. We call it the Bible. And so when we read the Bible, we know exactly how God wants us to live. And when we live according to the Bible, we find joy and happiness and success. We, we are totally fulfilled in life. And when we sin, when we walk away from what God wants us to do, what happens? We, we feel guilty. We feel depressed. Several years ago, well, many more than several years ago. I mean, I'm going back when my kids were young. And it's Christmas time. And so we, we get a Christmas gift or a kid. It's going to be a swing for the backyard. But I have to assemble it. But I want to wait till the kids go to bed. So they have to get to bed about 9 o'clock so I can start working on this swing set. Well, I don't need to read the instructions. I know what the thing looks like. 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. I haven't got anything connected right. <laughs> Finally, I decide to read the instructions. By 2 o'clock in the morning, it was done. See, God has given us His Word. And as we follow the instruction book, we're going to find purpose and fulfillment and joy and happiness in life. That's why we give Him glory. Third, 
To give God glory is a way to separate those who love Him from those who reject Him. Whoa. God's ultimate plan for us is to be with Him in heaven forever. Now, listen. If you don't enjoy praising God in the here and now, what makes you think you're going to enjoy heaven? Because whatever we do, I mean, there's going to be singing up there, there's going to be serving up there, but everything we do in heaven is for the glory of God. And if we don't enjoy serving God and giving Him glory now and praising His name, listen, you're going to be bored in heaven. This is a training ground for heaven. And those who give God glory are separating themselves from those who don't give glory to God. And God wants us to have that kind of separation. Why does He want us to have that kind of separation? Because our life might influence those who don't know Him. So when we praise God, when we honor God, we are doing the very thing we will ultimately be doing when we get to heaven. However, in the forming of man, there's some things I want us to see here. It's God's disappointment that not everyone would choose Him. Yet God knew it ahead of time. Our God is an all-knowing God. There's nothing that God does not know. He knows the beginning and the ending of all things. So let's understand what God knows about everybody in this room. First of all, God has personal knowledge of every person he created. Woo! David said this, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. Hmm. You know, God knows when you're going to go to bed tonight. He knows exactly when you're going to wake up in the morning. He knows exactly when you're going to sit down and when you rise up. He knows when you're going to go to the grocery store and exactly what you're going to buy. There isn't anything that God does not know about us personally. Secondly, he has private knowledge of every person he created. Notice what David said. You understand my thoughts from afar. Ooh. See, there are no secrets from God. God knows what's on your mind, right? God knows if you're paying attention or not. I may not know that. Unless you fall asleep on me. But God knows every time you have a thought. God knows your heart. That's why God can judge your motives. Man looks on the outward appearance, says Samuel, but God looks on the heart of man. The Bible says we're not to judge. What does that mean? Judge not lest you be judged. One of the most misunderstood words of Jesus Certainly we are to judge. You know what we're to judge? We're to judge people's actions. If a person goes into a 7-Eleven and robs the store, he's a thief. We're to judge a person's doctrine. You ought to be out there judging what I'm teaching. You ought to be judging what Kenton preaches or what Eric teaches. That's your responsibility. Is it in line with what the Word of God teaches? You need to bring judgment upon that. So we have a responsibility of judging, teaching, doctrine. But we have no business judging a person's motives, why they do what they do, because we can't read their heart. Only God can do that. Next, he has purposeful knowledge of every person he created. He not only has personal knowledge, he not only has private knowledge, he has purposeful knowledge. Paul writes this, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love, as the passage I was referring to earlier, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. How did God choose to save us? He chose to save us before the foundation of the world. That's amazing. That shows the omniscience of God. Even before you were born, in fact, even before he created the heavens and the earth, he knew about Ron Keller. Whoa! Put your name in there. He knew about you. He knew exactly when you would give your life to Christ, if you would. God chose you before the foundations of the world. He chose to save you. 
More than that, he chose to declare you holy and blameless before him. Wow. So the Lord knows those who are his, writes Paul. He knows those who are his. He knows those who are not his. Because he is an omniscient God. He knows everything. Since God knows everything, he knows those who will choose him and those who will reject him. Since he has created us as creatures having free will, and he knows the choices we are going to make even before we make one of them, it should seem obvious that God allows people to be born that he knows will not choose him. And this is the gamble God took when he made us in his image and in his likeness. He gave us the ability to choose. Now, the truth is this. God does create people he knows ahead of time are going to hell. Well, just answer the question. See, Lugosi says, why would God create somebody he knows ahead of time is going to hell? God knows. Again, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4. The Lord has made all for himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. So God created people he knows ahead of time are going to hell. But God does not take responsibility for their decisions. He has given everyone an innate awareness of himself. He has given everyone a conscience to know right from wrong. He has given everyone a mind to think with, to feel with, and to do with as he chooses. Now some would argue if God already knows the decisions that people will make ahead of time, how is that free will? See, God can know our decisions ahead of time because God knows us infinitely better than we know ourselves. Let me give you a simple example here. I've been married to Kathy for 11 years now. Boo, going on 12. That's amazing how time goes. But I've been blessed twice. Anyway, I don't know how many years into the marriage. I'll say four or five years into our marriage. We begin to think alike. I know what she's thinking before she opens her mouth. She knows what I'm thinking before I open my mouth. We sometimes say the same thing at exactly the same time in the same words. I didn't manipulate her. She doesn't manipulate me that way. We just know each other so well that we know what we're thinking ahead of time. And we could even say it at the same time. Now, if that's true of us as humans, see, how much more so is that of God, who created us in his image and in his likeness, who knows us infinitely better than we know ourselves. God knows our decisions ahead of time, but that has nothing to do with manipulating our free will. He just knows what our free will is. Remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And we said, how can God be sovereign, all sovereign, in control, and man have free will? And there are those who would say that the two just don't go together. Remember what we said. God will limit his sovereignty so that we can have free will, but in the end, God's sovereignty prevails. So God is a sovereign God. He lets us do whatever we want to do. He already knows what we're going to do, but he lets us do it. We have to pay the consequences when we do the wrong thing. And if we don't accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, in the end, God's sovereignty prevails, and hell is the result. Yes, God is disappointed that most people choose the wide road that leads to destruction rather than the narrow road that leads to eternal life. That was the danger of God giving man free will. But without free will, we would not be human. We would be more like a robot or a puppet acting at the bidding of the one who's in control. Even the most dedicated atheist would not like that. Though here, here's what's interesting about atheism. Atheism. No atheist believes in free will. You see, the atheist believes this. 
that we are the composite of molecules and particles and proteins that just accidentally came together and formed a human being. So, every atheist believes that they are under the control of those molecules, those particles, those proteins that made up their life. So an atheist then acts not on his own free will, but whatever he does, it's though he is programmed by how he was put together. You call this genetical evolution. That's what they call it, genetical evolution. So when you look at the bottom line of most skeptics, their argument is this. We cannot choose God because we have been programmed to deny the existence of God. Do you understand that? We can't believe in God. It's impossible because our makeup, our genetic makeup says God does not exist. Now, if God does not exist, listen, if God does not exist, then hell does not exist. So what's the purpose of the atheist questioning God in the first place about hell? What's the purpose of this question? If God is an all-knowing God, why would he create man to go to hell? That is a stupid question. He doesn't believe in God, and he doesn't believe in hell. So why raise the question? The only reason he's raising the question, the only motive is, is to ridicule the idea of God that it is stupid for you to believe in God. That's the whole purpose behind this question. Does that make sense? <laughs> Good. I'm glad I get some amens out there. Notice next. In the forming of man, it's God's desire to save all mankind. God wants all people to choose to be saved. God is allowing all accountable humans to choose their final destination. He wants them to choose life, to choose his son Jesus to be saved from the consequence of sin. Paul, writing to Timothy, said this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Peter writes, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but as long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God has provided a way to be saved. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death is separation from God. So what are we going to do? We're separated from God. So we have a choice. God says, I'm going to send my son down into this world. He's going to die on the cross. In his death, he's going to take all the sins of mankind on himself. And those who believe on him, because this Jesus is the perfect righteous one, his righteousness is going to come upon us. And we walk around bearing the righteousness of Christ. That's why God says, you're holy, you're blameless, you're perfect, because Jesus was holy and blameless and perfect. His total righteousness has come upon us. That's the best news there is. Now, you can either choose, you can either choose to put your faith in that Jesus who died for your sins, or you can pay the penalty for your sins yourself. Okay? That's the choice. It doesn't sound like a big decision to make, does it? So let's understand now the motives of the skeptic. He chooses to deny God so he can be accountable to no one but himself. See, that's how the skeptic thinks. I don't want to obey the laws of God. I don't want to have to be accountable to God. So I want to do what I want to do. So I'm just going to deny that God exists. He wants his own morality, not God's. He wants things his way, not God's way. Also, those who choose not to believe in God do so because they choose not to believe in hell. See, if I can eliminate the doctrine of hell, then... That's good. I don't have to worry. So if I eliminate hell, then it's easy not to believe in God. Here's what uh, G.K. Chesterton said. He was a philosopher Christian. To believe in the non-existence of God would be analogous to waking up some morning, looking in a mirror, and seeing nothing. 
with no reflection, no perception, no idea whatsoever of self. There would be nothing to conform to and nothing to modify. Thus, the Socratic maxim, know yourself, would be rendered impossible. Now, to be honest with you, you know, uh, Kenton today talked about looking at yourself in the mirror. Okay. It's kind of interesting we have some parallel here. When my wife gets up in the morning, she looks in the mirror. And she curls her hair. She puts rollers in her hair. And then she puts on makeup. And she takes the rollers out, and she looks beautiful. When I look in the mirror, I, I, yeah, I don't even have to comb my hair. I just wipe the sand out of my eyes and clean my teeth and shave, and man, I'm on my way. Now, why do women put makeup on? Why do women use cosmetics? Now, here's why. You know what the word cosmetic, the root word behind cosmetic is to rearrange. <laughs> I don't have to rearrange my face. But women have to rearrange their face because what they see in the mirror, they don't like. See, there's a reason why we look in a mirror. But think about it. This is what Chesterton is saying. A person who is an atheist looks in the mirror and he sees nothing. Nothing. And so he has no idea how to rearrange things. See, there's a God who's given us a moral code to live by. There's a God who has told us how to live. And if we don't understand that God, if we don't know that God, there's nothing we think we have to change in our life. So, to do away with God, that's what the atheists want. To do away with God means I can do whatever I want to do. I don't have to rearrange anything at all. I can just live my life the way I want to live my life. What have we learned today? That God is impartial, that God is just and merciful in all of His ways, that God has designed us with free will so we can make our own choices in life unaffected by His sovereignty. We've also learned it was the decision of God to create the human race, for by His will we are created. He did so for His own glory, that we would praise Him and thank Him for giving us life and salvation. His disappointment is that most have chosen not to follow Him, even though He knew that when He made humanity in the first place, we would not follow Him. And finally, we have learned that the desire of God is that all men everywhere repent and come to Jesus and be saved from the consequences of their sin which ultimately will lead them to eternal life. But if they don't, it will lead them to hell. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God created me, right? Aren't you glad to be alive today? Aren't you glad that God put you in this beautiful earth to enjoy everything? Aren't you glad God has given you gifts and resources? And aren't you glad, like I am, that I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, and I want to give Him glory and honor forever and ever. I'm doing it in this life because when I get to heaven, I'm going to spend my entire time in heaven, all eternity, just giving Him glory. So let's give Him glory now. Let's give Him praise now. Because when we give Him glory now, and when we give Him praise now, we are preparing ourselves for the life that is to come. Amen. Okay. Oh, is that microphone working? I don't hear you, Roy. Next week's lesson is going to be a lesson. I, in fact, none of these lessons I've ever heard anybody do. 
So you're getting, you're getting unique lessons here. I've never heard a sermon on what we talked about today. I've never heard anyone talk about, I've never read anything about what we've talked about today. Next week will be equally true. And here's our lesson for next week. Why is it that so many intelligent people reject the God of the Bible? I'm talking about intelligent people. I'm talking about scientists. I'm talking about professors. I'm talking about people with Ph.D. degrees. Why, why do they reject the God of the Bible? That's next week. Then the following week, the following week we're going to talk about how can we prove that Jesus is the true Messiah. That will be the last lesson in our series on apologetics. Now, have we got mics working? Yes, uh, Ron, we have to vacate the room by 12.20 oh, because right, we they have uh, another function that's going to take place at 12.30. So, we're still open for a couple of Q&As. Over, over here, way over here. Ron, uh, great message. Oh, thank um, you. I have a question in Luke chapter 16 16? Jesus I'm sorry, Luke chapter 16 yeah Jesus gave an eyewitness account about two men who died a rich man who went unnamed and a poor man named Lazarus yeah I've always found it rather ironic or maybe it's not quite